This program is made possible in part by the Maryland Arts Council through the State of Maryland and the National Endowment for the Arts and the Howard County Arts Council through a grant from Howard County Government. Hi, uh, welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. My name is Terrence Winch, and it's my uh, pleasure today to introduce to you Irish short story writer Claire Keegan. Uh, Claire is uh, a, a rising um, figure in the Irish literary world, perhaps signaled best by her appearance in this week's New Yorker magazine, where her uh, dazzling story, Foster, is really the highlight of, of, of this issue. Very, a very wonderful piece of writing that hopefully we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about later. Claire is the author of uh, two books of, of terrific short stories. Um, the first one is called Antarctica, which came out in 1999, and that was followed in 2007 by Walk the Blue Fields. Um, these are, are both really, really strong collections of, uh, of wonderful short stories that span a, a wide range of uh, settings and characters at, and, and, uh, uh, and and sentiments. In her review of Walk the Blue Fields, Anne Enright says of your fictional universe, Claire, this is a rural world of silent men and wild women who, for the most part, make bad marriages and uncomprehending children. It's a pagan place where priests break their vows and are spiritually impotent, where healers live in caravans and actually do heal and do see. I, I was really kind of struck by that comment, and it, it it reminded me of the sort of element of spirituality in your own work and the kind of uh, anti-traditional streak that that, that, uh, that spirituality and religion kind of plays in, in your stories. And, um, you know, there's the priest in, uh, in the one story who had the affair with the, uh, the young woman who's getting married, et cetera. Uh, and it also struck me, though, that given the momentous changes in the, the Catholic Church's uh, um, role in Irish life in the last you know, 20 or so years, that, um, that there isn't more of, of uh, the subject of religion being addressed in contemporary Irish writing, or am I wrong? Is there, are, are Irish writers looking at that more? Well, I don't know. I think, I think perhaps it's too soon to say. Yeah. Uh, it's too soon, perhaps, to write about it. It's just happened. <laughs> yeah. Even though it's been happening for a long yeah. time, it's just come out now. And they say the most difficult time of all to write about is the recent past. Right. So, so perhaps we are to some degree uncomprehending with regard to the subject and, and perhaps unwilling to find the language for it. It's a very difficult subject to write about. Um, but I mean, my, my story isn't, isn't about um, the sexual abuse that went on in the church. It's about um, a priest who wants to have a relationship and must make a, a choice between um, having a relationship, an, an open relationship with a woman, or staying in, in the church. And it's, a, it, it's an exploration of that from his point of view and his perspective. Um, so That's a terrific piece. And uh, uh, I, it seemed to me, though, that some of those, some of those uh, um, characters in some of the stories are suggestive of that, that theme maybe breaking out more in, in Irish writing, that whole subject of the church's um, uh, very, very changed role in Irish life. Although possibly the story could have happened 50 years ago. Yes, well, I suppose I suppose when we're writing, we don't want to write about something that will quickly date. Yes. Um, I think all good writing seems or has the quality of timelessness um, in its in its rhythm and and how it's poised. So uh, so no, I I suppose that. You know, we don't want to write fashionably, or if we want to write fashionably, perhaps we we do so just to make money rather than to to say something. Yeah, that timeless element seems particularly striking in your work, and I wasn't sure whether that comes out of the fact that you had a real rural upbringing, so the natural world plays a big part in your in your f 
fictional universe, and that has a, a changelessness to it that you don't get if you're writing stories that are you know, set more in, in cities, et cetera. Do you think that's... Uh, well, I suppose, you know, we, we look at nature and the four seasons roll around, and, and there's no way, if you look at that, that you can fool yourself that time is not passing. And, of course, fiction is a temporal art. It's based upon a time, which is wonderful. I mean, you just cannot take a character at any given point in a good story or a good novel and put them back where they were. They've mm. changed. Right. Um, but having said that about nature and, and your, your suggestion of its timelessness and its also its um, mark of time, um, I, I don't know that I believe. People do say that some of my stories perhaps are old-fashioned or set in a different time. Um, but I don't really believe there's anything in either of those books which couldn't plausibly happen today. Um, and I don't believe that human, human beings have changed very much. Yeah. I think right. we're still think made up of the same that. stuff, even though, even though the packaging might seem a little bit different. The, 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 uh, the priest in that same story, who I believe goes nameless, doesn't he? I think he is, yes. I think his name. Yeah, I'm not that fond of names. <laughs> Towards the end of, of, that, uh, of that story, he says something like, God, God is nature. Mm. Is, that, is, that, uh, is that his belief, do you think? Or yes, is that I think that's yeah. how he, he sees the world. I, see, I think he, he takes comfort in, in the landscape and sees God in what is all around him, and that's why he's such a good walker. Mm -hmm. um, that he, or part of the reason why, what he sees in his walks. Um, I suppose I'm always interested in what, what the gaze falls on. What the gaze falls on is the perspective, and what your gaze follows gives you away. Mm -hmm. and, and when I look at what he looked at, I found his story. You know, um, just to get away from Ireland for a little bit, you came to this country, to the U.S., at age 17, from, from I assume, from rural Ireland at that yes. point, to New Orleans, the Big Easy. Yes. That must have been a pretty uh, uh, amazing transition to make. What well, was it, was that a like? it was a dramatic shift. Yeah. <laughs> um, How did you deal with that? Well, I dealt with it in, in different ways. Uh, Everything in my experience is mixed. Um, I I dislike the weather intensely. Oh, I like being yeah. outside. Yeah. Um, I suppose I was I was surprised um, by America. I was even though uh, and I hadn't read very much American literature at that time, but I I was surprised with the huge division between black and white culture in New Orleans and and the the economic differences, the obvious apparent differences in in the lifestyles. Do you feel that your your time in this country has had much of an impact on your writing? Well yes of course I do. I do. Um, most of all through my undergraduate studies here. I I went to Loyola University in New Orleans. Jesuit school. And uh, yeah. yes yeah. and uh, for the most part, I, I enjoyed my time there intensely, yeah. and I loved being a student. And I, I read in a way I can no longer read uh, deeply and concentratedly. And, uh, because there's not as much time now, you mean? No, I'm, I'm a different reader now. I, I'm more difficult to please. It's more difficult to get lost. It's it's difficult yeah, not not that. to right. look at the syntax and the arrangement of the words and be deeply critical of the paragraphs, right. but then I, I could I could read as, as uh, someone who just goes into a new territory and gazes around and I had some some wonderful teachers, in the English department there, and uh, I I read a great deal of American literature and and uh, many of the, the Southern writers and American writers, and, and uh, it was a new world to me. Uh, Speaking of the, the Southern writers, I was looking at um, the introduction to Flannery O'Connor's Everything That Rises Must Converge the other day, 
This is Robert Fitzgerald's introduction. And he quotes O'Connor as saying that the fiction writer presents mystery through manners, grace through nature, but when he finishes, there's al there always has to be left over that sense of mystery which cannot be accounted for by any human formula. And that immediately seemed to me to be uh, suggestive of, of some of your work, that kind of sensibility. Was she a, an influence on you, O'Connor? Well, I, I, d I, don't I don't really know that I could call Flannery O'Connor an, an influence. Um, I, I certainly admire her work, and, and she's, she's original, and uh, she's just a wonderful writer. Yes, she is. Wonderful the Burning writer. Palms really reminded me hmm. of O'Connor, the story where the, uh, the, the grandson is sort of guilt-tripped by his grandmother uh, in, as a, a contributor to, to his mother's death in a bizarre accident, et cetera. And some of the exchanges they have seemed really O'Connor-like to me. So I, I wondered whether she had that much I of I certainly hadn't, didn't yeah. have her in, in mind when I was writing that story. But I've taught some of her stories, uh, including Displaced Person, which is a long story. People mm -hmm. don't don't often seem to read, and uh, I and Greenleaf and is another one of my favorite stories. But she's uh, she's just wonderful. She is. Amazing. And I think what she she's is referring amazing. to there, perhaps, or or my version of what she was referring to there is, you know, there there is only so much you you do or you say as a writer, and then you must rely quite heavily on the reader, and their own consciousness and their own mysteries and their own private lives to, to explore the mystery of what is not said within that given story. And it's unaccountable. Mm. And, and uh, one of the glorious reasons why, why we read. Yeah, you have a, a number of, of, uh, of passages and statements in the stories that, that, uh, that call to mind that, that particular theme. Um, in Foster, the New Yorker story, the, the girl narrator talks about the perfect opportunity to say nothing, alluding to something similar said early in the story. And, um, and it seems to me that in some of your work, uh, the, the texts work almost more by subtraction than by addition, that, they're, that you're, you know, you're definitely trying to make room, as it were, in the stories for that mystery to, to have some place by not saying everything. The, the girl narrator in Men and Women says, something I don't fully understand is happening, <laughs> which I thought was a great line. And, and of course, that's, you could say that almost about all of life I as think you go so. through it. Yeah. Uh, and in the Ginger Rogers sermon, um, one of the characters says, that's the way it is in our house, everybody knowing things but pretending they don't. <laughs> well, people say very little, yeah, particularly yeah. in Ireland. Yes. Well, um, tell us a little bit about how you work these days, you know, what your, what your own sort of process is like. What, 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 what I'm interested in is what really starts a story going in your head, and how does it go from there to a start on the page? Well, I don't really know how I begin, and I know I do begin with great difficulty and, and trepidation and fear. Um, but what starts a story is usually something, something won't go away. And so it um, antagonizes you to the point where you start writing. And anything I'm excited about, I'm now wary of. Because if you're excited about it, it's something obvious and it's not a story. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think stories are uncovered and reluctantly told. The stories themselves, I think all fine stories are told with varying degrees of reluctance. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. And if anything volunteers itself, uh, or is ready, or seems um, available, it's probably going to burn away and vanish, and just turning into nothing. Um, I think stories don't want to be told <laughs> in, in the yeah. way, don't want to be written in the way that we at crucial times in our lives, when things are painful, we are very reluctant to speak of it. And we try yeah. 
we try to speak with caution, I think, um, when we do speak. But of course, language is just so revealing mm -hmm. and we cannot help but reveal ourselves once we begin. There's a wonderful story by Sherwood Anderson called The Other Woman, which is about that very, very subject. It's about a man who, who begins to talk to another man and then regrets during the telling of his story, the telling of his story. Um, but he, he at the same time cannot resist. And I love the reluctance with, wi with which it's told and the truth the reader comes to and finds in the story and yet what the man obviously cannot consciously face within himself. And uh, I think it's a, a lovely example of that. Does, do you wait for the stories to happen or do you work um, on, a, on a pretty disciplined uh, schedule? I'm not nearly as disciplined as I would like to be. I've had a quite an unsettled life, especially recently. And so, um, but I, I don't think I'm, I'm short on material. Mm -hmm. I wish I made the time and disciplined myself to write everything I, I would like to write. Do you plan to stay with the short story or are you looking at writing some novels or? I have a novel drafted. Oh, you do? And I have, um, I'm working on a new story as well. What's I have two stories, uh, a very short story rolling around my head at the moment and, and a longer one. What's going on with the novel? Well, the novel is, is drafted and it's, and it's there and um, people are asking for it. You mean the first draft or are you, are you? No, the beginning is, is finished, I think. But you never know if a beginning is finished until you have the ending completely done and the language right. Yeah. So I don't think that you can ever really say that any part of any work of fiction is, is finished until it all is. Mm -hmm. So you're still working on it? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Well it needs a lot of work. <laughs> There's loads of room for Can you tell us anything about it? It's about a, a woman who goes to live with, uh, who marries in the first chapter, a uh, farmer, a sheep farmer, and goes to live with him and his father on, on the mountain on Mount Leinster in the Black Stairs mm -hmm. in County Carlow. And, uh, and she there confronts her past w within the marriage. It sounds like a, a Claire Keegan uh, fictional world. Yes, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I have great fun with the, with the father. I think, he's, I think he's great fun. Oh, good, because I wanted to ask you about fathers who don't come off all, all too uh, positively in a lot of your work. And, um, Do they I in anybody's? I, yeah, well, I don't, I, that's a good question. I'd have to think about that. I mean, I can't, I can't really think of a good father in Irish literature, except in, um, not that I've thought about this very deeply, yeah, but really. off the top of my head, yeah. I would have to say that Roddy Doyle's, um, Roddy Doyle has written good fathers, but I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. But you know, we, we, do t we do tend to write about what's troublesome rather than they yes. say happiness yeah, writes white. Yeah. So the good fathers don't ever really make it onto the page. Well, the other thing I wanted to ask you about before I forget is uh, when I started reading your work a while ago, I started with, of course, your first book and with the first story, which is the title story in the book. And uh, it, um, it's a really kind of chilling tale. I didn't know whether the rest of your writing was going to be, uh, you know, similar, and and it's it's not for the most part. But it uh, it kind of reminded me of early Ian McEwan stories. I mean, there was mm. that creepy, sinister. Yes, I like uh, those stories very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, I do too. Um, and I uh, I read this and I thought, God, this must have caused a drop in adultery in Ireland. You know. Precipitously. <laughs> I don't think a short story causes a drop in adultery did it, well anywhere. Did it seems very, it does seem like a real cautionary fable to, to uh, I mean, I could see women reading it. I don't mean to speak for women, but I could see mm. women reading it and, and feeling that this was a uh, kind of warning not to stray outside of uh, one's marriage and that kind yes. of thing. Well, I suppose I believe that if you stray outside of your marriage, you've got to know that you're risking everything. <laughs> yeah. I, I do believe that. Yeah, yeah. I, think yeah, if yeah. I, I think if you go outside the marriage, 
um, you do, you take a huge risk and yeah. you've got to know as an adult that you could lose everything. Yeah. And I suppose uh, she did, she lost everything. Yeah, she did in a, in a, in a pretty horrific way. Um, the last story in, um, in the, the second book, in Walk the Blue Fields, the uh, Night of the Quicken Trees, is that the right Yes, one? that's right. Um, that seemed kind of a, an interesting departure in some ways from the rest of the stories. It almost was a marriage of, of the short story and the folk tale. You know, there's yes. the, the, the uh, Margaret, is it Margaret? The, yes. the main character who's kind of a, a seer and a witch and a, you know, um, uh, uh, an almost supernatural character. And her next door neighbor who's has a goat as his female Stag. companion. And yeah, yes. Stag. What what uh, what led you to that story? Well, I was reading a lot of folklore at the time, and I think it's so lively, and it's a it's a lovely part of Irish culture, our folklore. Does it resonate with your own upbringing on the farm and all of that? Well, as well? I suppose some of it would, but most of it most of it wouldn't resonate with me personally, I other than in the sense that I'm deeply interested in it and find it um, very lively. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I, th I thought that she was a great character, and then I invented yeah, Stack, yeah. and I gave him his goat, Josephine, who I absolutely love. I, I just thought she was great as well. And I, I just stayed writing that story for months, um, trying to keep it as short as it is. And it was, at that time, I would say the longest story I had written. It was 10 or 12,000 words, yeah. I think. Yeah. And, and so I was... Uh, I was uh, setting it in a place I had lived, um, near the Cliffs of Moor in mm -hmm. County Clare. Mm. And I used the whole weather there mm -hmm. and, and let that blow in across the story to try and bring them together, which it did in a power cut. Yeah. And uh, I, I had a lot of you fun you writing that, that story. I can tell you had fun with that story. Yeah. <laughs> Before we, we run out of time, Claire, I wanted to ask you if you would read something, and I thought maybe uh, a, a chunk of the new story that's in the New Yorker would yes, be a good Yes, of one course. To read. It is a much longer story, and the editor, uh, Deborah Treesman at the New Yorker, uh, we made it much, we worked together to make it much shorter. So, um, and it's just about a, it's about a, a girl who goes to live with her mother's cousin and her husband on a farm uh, in County Wexford for, for the summer. And this is just a, a little section of it here where before her, fa her father takes her there in a hot day and it's a hot summer. And uh, he just, this is the scene where he, he leaves her. When we sit in at the table, Da tastes the ham and reaches for the beetroot. He doesn't use the serving fork but put pitches it onto the plate with his own. It stains the pink ham, bleeds. Tea is poured. There's a patchy silence as we eat, as our knives and forks breaks up, break up what's on our plates. After some little scraps of speech, the tart is cut. Cream falls over the hot pastry into warm pools. Now that my father has delivered me and eaten his fill, he is anxious to light his fag and get away. Always it's the same. He never stays in any place long after he's eaten, not like my mother, who would talk until it grew dark and light again. This, at least, is what my father says. I have never known it to happen. With my mother, it's all work, us, the butter making, the dinners, the washing up and getting up and getting ready for mass and school, weaning calves and hiring men to plough and harrow the fields, stretching the money and setting the alarm for time before the sun rises. But this is a different type of house. Here there is room to think. There may even be money to spare. I'd better hit the road, Da says. What hurry is on you, Kinsella says. The daylight is burning and I've yet the spuds to spray. There's no fear of blight these evenings, the woman says, but she gets up anyway and goes out the back door with a sharp knife. A silence climbs between the men while she is gone. Give this to Mary, she says, coming in. 
I'm snowed under with the rhubarb, whatever kind of year it is. My father takes the rhubarb from her, but it is awkward as the baby in his arms. A stalk falls on the floor, and then another. He waits for her to pick them up, to hand them to him. She waits for him to do it himself. In the end, it's Kinsella who stoops. There now, he says. Out in the yard, my father throws the rhubarb onto the back seat, gets in behind the wheel and starts the engine. Good luck to ye, he says. I hope this girl will give no trouble. He turns to me. Try and not fall into the fire, you. I watch him reverse, turn into the lane and drive away. Why did he leave without so much as a goodbye or ever mentioning when he would come back for me? What's ailing you, child? The woman says. I look at my feet, dirty in my sandals. Kinsella stands in close. Whatever it is, tell us. We won't mind. Lord God Almighty, didn't he go and forget all about your wee bits and bobs, the woman says. No wonder you're in a state. Well, hasn't he a head like a sieve, the same man? Not a word about it, Kinsella says. We'll have you togged out in no time. When I follow the woman back inside, I want her to say something to put me at ease. Instead, she clears the table, picks up the sharp knife, and stands at the window washing the blade under the running tap. She stares at me as she wipes it clean and puts it away. Now, Gerline, she says, I think it's nearly time you had a bath. And that's the end of that section. Beautiful, Claire. Thanks so much for that reading. That was a wonderful piece of writing. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And thank you all for joining us today on Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. <laughs> Thank you.